Hey friends, Josh here. When I was in college, I had a friend who invited me to go to the gym with him for weight training. Now, I was a skinny little point guard in high school basketball and I'd never really lifted weights before. So I said, why not? It might be fun to get in shape and get away from staring at a computer screen for a little while. And so we go and we start with a chest workout, specifically the bench press. Now, I remember laying back on this bench and seeing the bar above my head, and I grabbed the bar and I asked my friend, hey Mike, how much weight should we start with? And now if you're familiar with the bench press, you'll know that the bar weighs 45 pounds or 20 kilograms. And I thought, hey, I've never done this before, but it can't be that hard, right? Well, I just watched my friend finish a warm-up set of 10 repetitions with a plate on each side. That's a 45 pound weight on each side of the bar. Now, much to my surprise, my friend said to me, we're not going to put any weight on. Now, I was a little shocked. I was a little embarrassed. <laughs> I mean, surely a young, healthy 18-year-old kid should be able to put at least more than just the bar. I mean, should be able to bench more than just that 45-pound bar, right? And I mean, my friend just made it look so easy with a plate on each side, 135 pounds. So I unracked the bar, I held it above my chest, and I realized in that moment how wrong I was because the bar began to wobble and I struggled to control the movement. Uh, my arms just kept flailing a little bit. And this was just a completely foreign experience to me. And no matter how much my mind thought that I could handle it, my muscles showed that I couldn't. And without my friend as a spotter to grab the bar, the bar I certainly would have injured myself. But once I was able to get the bar under control, my friend was guiding me through the steps. He helped me to focus. He helped me to breathe. And finally, I completed an initial set of 10 reps. Now, I remember having a number of different feelings after I re-racked the bar and stood up from the bench. I was, number one, relieved that it was over. Number two, I was embarrassed that I was a lot weaker than I thought I was. And number three, I was determined to get stronger. Now, it was about a year, maybe a little over a year later, uh, after a bunch of consistent hard work, that I was able to bench a set of 10 with a plate on each side. That's 135 pounds total. Now, I tell you that story because I think it has a lot of application to being a disciple of Jesus. I have folks asking me all the time, Josh, how do I grow as a disciple? How do I stop sinning? How can I be more pleasing and more obedient to Jesus? And I think modern Western culture affects how we understand growth and maturity. I think like so many things, we assume there's a shortcut. And like, think of it this way. If you're hungry, what do you do? You just go out and get fast food. If you have a headache, well, you take some pain relievers. If you have a question about anything, well, you can just ask Google or Siri. But when it comes to maturing as a disciple, there's no shortcuts. You can't go to one conference or read one good book and have it all figured out. I want to talk about how we grow as a disciple, but first I want to take a bit to explain what it actually means to be a disciple. Because to be a follower or a disciple of Jesus means much more than just saying a prayer and believing something true about Jesus. Because for the Jewish people at the time of Jesus, the disciple was essentially a student of a teacher, and that teacher was called a rabbi. To put it simply, Jewish rabbis read and interpreted their scriptures, called the Tanakh, and then they taught their students how to understand what Moses and the prophets wrote. And then they modeled a lifestyle in accordance with that understanding. The expectation in a continuing discipleship relationship was that the rabbi students would seek to grow in both the knowledge and the manner of life as the rabbi. So to be a disciple of Jesus means two things. First, that we grow in his understanding and interpretation of the law and the prophets. And then second, that we imitate his manner of life as the appropriate response to God's reliability and trustworthiness to do what he's promised. So we learn from him, we obey him, and we imitate him. Now, there's no better place to see these realities converge than in the life and the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels. And if you're familiar with Jesus' teachings, he says some pretty radical things, at least to our modern ears. Now, his audience was Jewish people in the first century, so there's lots of things that don't initially make a lot of sense to us Westerners 2,000 years later. For them, Jesus was calling them away from the baseless hatred that filled the people of Israel at the time, and how this is contrary to the Torah as given them at Mount Sinai. And even though first century Jews are the primary audience of the Sermon on the Mount, we shouldn't dismiss his words as ancient and inapplicable to us because they're describing to us what God himself is like. Now more on that in a bit. 
I mentioned in a previous video that I called, this is the hardest thing about being a disciple of Jesus, that the Lord's call to discipleship is a call to follow him with the expectation that it could cost us everything. That obeying him and following his teachings and manner of life could result in the loss of our own life. Now, if we don't consider this, if we don't count the cost, as Jesus would say, then we won't have the ability to continue being his disciple, especially when the heat gets turned up and the pressure mounts. More on that in a bit, too. So what are some of the things Jesus teaches about, and how does he expect his disciples how to live? Maybe what comes to mind for many of you is the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Now, in Matthew 5, for example, Jesus says a number of things that sound just so absurd to us. For example, he says, hmm, it matters how you respond relationally when you're slapped by evil people. Okay, it matters how you respond when people falsely accuse you and take you to court and want to take all your stuff. <laughs> Number three, it matters how you respond when there is government overreach that leads you to forced labor. By the way, this is what Jesus means when he says if someone compels you to walk one mile, go with him too, because the context for that is, for a first century Jew, is being forced to walk a mile by the Roman government, their demands on the people. Another thing that he says is, it matters how you respond when you have needy friends and family. And number five, it yet more, it matters how you respond when you have enemies that want to persecute you. So what does he say his disciples are supposed to do in these kind of situations? Well, when you're slapped by evil people, you turn the other cheek and you let him slap that too. When someone wrongly takes you to court, give more than what you're sued for. When a power compels you to work for them, submit to the overreach. And don't deny friends and family who are needy. Whoa. <laughs> these are Jesus's words, friends. This is what he's teaching. Now, if we're being honest, these things seem so unreasonable and offensive to us. And just by reading those words, we can see that the beginning of discipleship really doesn't have anything to do with learning how to preach the gospel in a Muslim nation and getting martyred in the mission field. The beginning of discipleship is about benching the bar. Maybe we have a lot of zeal. Maybe we'll say, yes, I'll go to the mission field and die for Jesus. But there's no way we're going to be able to bench press two plates or 225 pounds successfully if we struggle with our form on a 45-pound bar. If we have no strength to resist temptation, to retaliate when it comes to relational issues and false accusation or having our things stolen, we're fooling ourselves if we think we'll have strength to give up everything when the heat gets turned up and we're asked to renounce Jesus at the threat of death. I talk with a lot of young people who tell me things like, I get angry at my roommates when they don't clean their dishes, <laughs> or I don't like how my coworkers make fun of me for going to church on Sundays. And I tell them, well, here's what you do. You do their dishes for them and you don't go out of your way to tell them that you did. <laughs> Many of them look at me like I have seven heads and 10 horns, but I say, hey, you're benching the bar, bro. Like responding with humility, serving in secret, not seeking recognition, not retaliating when you're wronged, that is discipleship 101. That's what it means to obey Jesus. Just keep doing that. It's going to get easier. And when the time comes to add weight, you're going to have the form down. You're going to know what to do when someone really mistreats you or your family, or you have a lot of money stolen from you or major false accusations come up, or your life is threatened because of your faith in Jesus. And when I say to them, we ask the Lord, help me to grow, help me to love you more. I say, we're asking him to help us obey him and to be more like him. So what is he going to do? Well, he's probably not going to start by giving you a one-way ticket on a plane to a terrorist state in the Middle East. He's probably going to bring people across your path that are going to bring out your impatience. He's going to give you opportunities for sacrificial generosity and to serve people without recognition. He's going to give you opportunities to go low, to humble yourself before people in a way that grinds up against your flesh and your desire to be seen and known. And this is what it means to follow Jesus and to be his disciple. And as we do these things, we're going to grow and mature. So why does Jesus teach these things? What's the basis for the seemingly offensive things that he says? Well, it follows just a few verses later in Matthew 5, verses 44 and 48, where Jesus says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you can be sons of your Father in heaven. And then verse 48, he says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In other words, the basis for Jesus' teachings is 
This is what God is like, and this is what the age to come will be like. And I say much more about this in another video on my channel here called Fight Sin with a Clear Vision of the Future. We have to remember that our view of the future determines how we live in the present. What it's going to be like in the age to come is what motivates behavior and thoughts and lifestyle today. So how is our life today lining up with how we were created to live in the beginning and how we're destined to live when Jesus returns? Because a real day of judgment and reckoning is coming and because unrighteousness is not going to exist in the age to come. This is why Jesus exhorts his followers with the seemingly unreasonable things that he does. Because this manner of life is God's standard, and he'll be faithful and just to punish the wicked and reward the righteous on that day, according to that standard. So I want to leave you with that today. Ask the Lord for opportunities to bench the bar, to exercise simple obedience, especially when no one is looking. So as I've said before, eschatology is what drives discipleship and so we need to be filling our minds with what the scriptures say about the future as well this isn't complex friends but it is hard just stick with it day by day by day and may the lord give us grace to be his disciples and persevere until the end amen drop a like on this video and leave a comment below if this was encouraging and subscribe for more to come god bless shalom and maranatha